It's good to see all of you tonight. Uh, we are uh, the fourth weekend to our series, and this uh, and Sunday will be the fourth uh, Sunday into the Lent series. Gail spoke last week. Ed Murray is this week, and uh, next week I hope you'll come back for Pete Candler will be here next week. That's Shannon Candler's son. He is from Asheville, North Carolina. He is a professor and is writing a novel at this time from Asheville, North Carolina. Got some cute children that I don't think will be with him, will they? They won't be with him, but... <laughs> so, uh, and uh, Pete has done this kind of series before. He was a professor at... Um, Baylor University in Texas and has been uh, involved in a series like this before, so it will be it will be really fascinating. So I hope you'll come back. And please come back and have soup. We had 51 for soup tonight, so that's great. So very good soup. Thanks, ladies, for uh, cooking some soup and cornbread for us and having that for us. Ked Murray tonight and his wife, Ann, back there. Raise your hand, Ann. She helps, she helps in the process also. Ked went to Virginia Military Institute, got his civil engineering degree there, <coughs> then went to work for the Army Corps of Engineers for two years. He spent 36 years with Caterpillar, 14 of those years in Japan and Switzerland. The, Switzerland. They have two boys and two grandchildren, and they have been at the lake for about 14 years. I asked him when he started painting, has he always been interested in painting? And he said, well, he painted more when he came, when he retired and moved to the lake. But that he's always been involved or, or interested in that. Just, you know how it is when you're working. You just don't have time to do this kind of thing. So, uh, I don't know if you know this, but Ked paints Santas a lot. And he sends out a Christmas card every year of a Santa that he has painted. Very interesting Santa, so you'll have to ask him about painting his Santas. Ked, thanks for doing this. Um, and here we go. Here we go. <laughs> uh, first, thank you everybody for attending tonight. I feel like we're in the fourth week of Italian Idol. Uh, uh, voting will begin shortly after the end of the program. And, Voting votes will be accepted for the next 90 minutes. Tonight I would like to talk to you about Leonard. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and who am I speaking of? Michael Michelangelo Bonarote de Lovitico Simone, better known as Michelangelo. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, last week, those of you who were here, uh, Gail talked about Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, Leonardo and Michelangelo were contemporaries of sorts, and we'll talk about that a little bit today. Uh, so I want to review some of the highlights of Michelangelo's life and some of the uh, broad paintings that he was involved, uh, artwork that he was involved with, which extended far beyond sculpting uh, and painting and into poetry and literature. Michelangelo was born in 1475, 17 years before Columbus uh, sailed to the New World. He was second of five sons and his father was considered a minor uh, noble. Uh, he was born in Caprese, which is about uh, 60 miles from uh, uh, Florence, where his father was serving a six-month term as mayor, as was popular in those times. Uh, the mayor served six months out of Florence, which was the master city-state that covered Caprese. A month after he was born, they moved back to uh, Florence, and Michelangelo was wet nursed uh, by the wife of a quarryman in Settignano, which is just outside of Venice. During that time, uh, he became very close to that uh, quarryman's family and learned how to work with rock. Uh, the quarry materials that they dealt with were marble 
and travertine. Much is known about Michelangelo's life because of the surviving letters, the sonnets, and of course the artwork he produced. But there are also uh, many myths and some myths and information. And tonight I'd like to review some of these and allow you to ask questions anytime during the presentation and then we'll have an opportunity at the end also for a question and answer. Uh, a lot of you may have read uh, Irving Stone's book, uh, Agony in the Ecstasy, which was written in the early 60s. And then there was a movie in 1964 with Charlton Heston and Rex Harrison, uh, also the Agony in the Ecstasy. Both uh, of these were great book, very interesting, but they also contributed to some of the misinformation that exists uh, about Michelangelo. And let's start looking at some of the uh, fact and potential fiction that exists. First, as you can see here in the picture, uh, Michelangelo didn't really resemble uh, Charlton Heston. <laughs> Physically, he did. He was about five feet four inches tall. And he weighed 110 to 120 pounds. Uh, but he had magnificent eyes, was the description. And a very strong personality and a great attraction uh, to people. Uh, he was brash. In some respects, he reminds me a little bit of Joe Martinson. <laughs> Very humorous, bold, sure of himself, uh, without being obnoxious, <laughs> but he was very confident. Uh, and he, he was, but he was not the least bit shy or the least bit unassuming. He knew what he wanted and he would go after doing what he wanted. Uh, second uh, myth is that he was reclusive and perhaps not even uh, very well read. And that's not true either. Uh, Michelangelo, when he worked, uh, was very reclusive in his work and worked alone most of the time. Uh, and, but he was extremely literate. He uh, dropped out of school when he was 13 years old. Uh, and he was in the Latin school in Florence, much to the chagrin of his father, uh, who uh, <clears throat> was somewhat impoverished uh, noble and was looking for his second son to provide support to the family financially. When Michelangelo dropped out, uh, he was fluent in Italian and very well read, had written, uh, read uh, the Bible, uh, Thoroughly, Dante, many of the poets, uh, uh, quite a number of the famous uh, Italian pieces of literature, but he did not speak uh, Latin and he did not know Greek, uh, which he regretted the rest of his life, never having followed up those two subjects. Uh, another uh, thought about Michelangelo is that he knew and uh, was a bit envious of Leonardo da Vinci. And that's a little bit of yes and a little bit of no. He knew, certainly knew who Leonardo uh, da Vinci was because Leonardo was also from Florence. But Leonardo was 25 years older than Michelangelo. And the only time they really had direct contact was a brief period in uh, uh, his middle life where they were both members of the Poet Society, which was an art uh, league or art alliance in Florence. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, Michelangelo didn't like painting. He felt that uh, painting was the art of filling space uh, with image. And that empty space, the uh, painters just kept painting to fill it where he much preferred sculpting because he considered that sculpting was removing the superfluous material to reveal the image that uh, rested inside. So his principal interest had always been sculpting. And we'll see a little later how this also influenced his life. 
Uh, third thing was that Michael Angelo was not particularly religious. That also is a fallacy. He was a regular churchgoer. Uh, he was well, well read in the Bible. And uh, during the time that he served with uh, Lorenzo de' Medici, who I'll talk about in a middle, minute, uh, he was regularly exposed to some of the greatest minds in Europe, uh, both religiously and uh, scientifically. This is a sketch of Florence uh, back in the uh, 14th century. Uh, Florence, uh, well, all of Italy at that time was composed of city-states. Each of these states had their own responsibility for forming their government, managing their own economic uh, standards. And the population of Florence at that time, within the walls, was about 50,000 people. Also directly outside the walls was another 50,000 farmers and uh, people like uh, he lived with uh, who did quarrying. The central government of uh, Florence at the time was a republic, so uh, people in the uh, trade classes and above were eligible to run for office. The unofficial head of Florence at that time was an individual by the name of Lorenzo de' Medici, or Lorenzo the Magnificent. He was not an elected official, but he was probably one of the richest people in uh, Europe at the time. He had a tremendous interest in the arts, in science, in philosophy, and was a benefactor for the entire city to the point where he was de facto ruler. Lorenzo, uh, Michelangelo, at the age of 13, I said, uh, decided to quit school and devote his life to art. And to his father's uh, chagrin, he decided he, uh, he was offered an opportunity from a friend of his to join uh, the studio of uh, Guillermo uh, Cirlandio, who was at the time the most prolific uh, fresco artist in, uh, in Florence. <coughs> Sculpting had died out about 50 years before when Donatello, who was a famous Florence sculptor, passed away. And because of the expense and the time consuming, it was not a popular art for uh, artists to, a uh, medium for artists to get into. So the only opportunity Michelangelo had was to uh, apply to be a, an apprentice at uh, Cirlandio's uh, studio. Normally apprentices paid the master to study about uh, six uh, Florentine a year. Uh, Michelangelo, on the basis of the drawings that he took, and because he was financially marginal, uh, walked in with a great confident air and told Cirlandio he'd like to be an apprentice, but uh, I want you to pay me. <laughs> And to everybody's surprise, uh, he said, okay. And so for a year, Michelangelo worked as an apprentice uh, in the fresco shop, basically doing drawings, mixing paint, uh, learning uh, art techniques. Then Lorenzo de' Medici decided that he wanted to form a, a rebirth of sculpting in Florence. So he set up a, a sculpture garden in his estate and asked uh, Cirlandio for his two best artists. And at the age of 14, Michelangelo then went to the sculpture garden that uh, Lorenzo was setting up. Uh, he was studying under the last remaining uh, student that was alive from Domitello, and that was a fellow named Bertolo Bertolio. And, uh, but very frustrated for the first year that he was there that Bertolo would only give him projects of building uh, wire frames for sculpting, uh, putting uh, either clay or uh, wax around the wire frames and sharpening tools. 
and he couldn't understand uh, why he wasn't getting any attention. So he grabbed a spare piece of marble that was laying around. It's 22 by 15 inches uh, wide, and this is the first carving that he did by himself in the garden at the age of 16. And this is uh, obviously the Madonna and the child, but it's an amazing piece. Uh, whoops. This is called the Madonna on the stairs, and it shows Mary sitting at the base of the staircase. The stair railing that goes up uh, forms the main beam of the cross. Uh, that's John the Baptist up there, and notice how his arm is positioned, and uh, that gives the effect of the cross. Michelangelo, in what he was trying to carve, was trying to establish that at this time, Mary hadn't totally acquiesced to uh, God's request. Uh, she was sitting there, she visualized what was ahead for the Christ child, and this is Christ, uh, his interpretation. He was turning away, burying his uh, head in the, the robes. And as you can see from her expression, uh, she is gazing out and realizing what's going to happen and giving a great thought. The other uh, significant fact is that uh, her face it's not a typical Roman face. It's more of a Grecian uh, outline to it. That I found fascinating, that at, at that age he was able to come to that kind of an interpretation. Uh, in the meantime, my, uh, Lorenzo de' Medici saw this piece and recognized uh, the inherent talent that Michelangelo had and he moved him inside the house and he lived in a room and was paid a small salary on a monthly basis which made his father very happy um, and he'd eat every night at the dinner table with the Medici family and be exposed to uh, the inner circle of advisors, the humanists as they were called uh, that uh, Lorenzo uh, surrounded himself with. Uh, unfortunately, after two years in the house, which Michelangelo considered the best period of his life, uh, Lorenzo died of a combination of the gout and syphilis. <laughs> so, he was a good guy, a painter of the art, but obviously the best around <laughs> Uh, and at the same time, uh, a very unpopular, uh, well, a very uh, uh, flamboyant and Dominican friar moved into uh, Florence uh, by the name of um, Savonarola. And he was a fire and brimstone uh, Dominican friar and started uh, a series of scathing reviews about uh, uh, the nobles of Florence and their lifestyle and comparing Florence to Sodom and Gomorrah and preaching sermons that uh, the Great Flood was going to wipe out uh, Florence and Piero, the younger, the oldest son of Lorenzo had tried to take over his responsibility, but was not popular. Uh, and after two years, the people of Florence uh, rose up and forced uh, Piero and the rest of the Medici family out of Florence. And remember uh, back, uh, probably 15 years ago, there was a book, The Van Bonfire of the Vanities. Well, actually, The Bonfire of the Vanities was the title of what was going on in Florence at the time where under Savonarola's uh, uh, urging, uh, all of the major artwork uh, was brought to the main square and a number of uh, bonfires were held and they burned and destroyed a lot of the artwork. 
for, so for two years, uh, De Medici and uh, uh, Michelangelo fled to uh, Bologna. And finally, when things quieted down a little, they came back to Florence. And Michelangelo had decided, he was 19 at the time, that he really wanted to go to uh, Rome because Rome was where the principal opportunity existed to get commissions, particularly for sculpting. So he, uh, at the urging of another cousin of the original Lorenzo, uh, did a carving of a sleeping Cupid. And they stained it with tea, rubbed it with uh, earth, and then shipped it off to Rome to try to pass it off as a piece of antiquity. It's a big market in Rome with cardinals. Uh, Michelangelo says he felt guilty about that. <laughs> there are a lot of people who speculation that that was not the case, that uh, he fully realized uh, what was going to happen. And the piece was eventually sold to the richest cardinal in Rome, Riario. Uh, and didn't take long for him to suspect uh, that there was something not quite right about it. So he called uh, Michelangelo to come to Rome so he could talk to him. Michelangelo went and uh, admitted to the fraud, but Riario was so impressed that he contracted him for another sculptor, which we'll talk about in a minute. But the other thing that was interesting at the time was that when Michelangelo got to Rome, the population of Rome was only 70,000 people, down from 250,000 people at the height of the Roman Empire. The city was a mess. There was garbage everywhere, but uh, under the church, the pope, and the prevailing cardinals, there was a strong attempt to rebuild but a lot of the rebuilding was being done with the marble and the stone from the original Roman Empire. But Riorio uh, decided to contract uh, Michelangelo to do a statue. And this is of Bacchus, the god of wine. And at that time, Michelangelo was 21 years old. The statue is six and a half feet tall. You can't see it very well, but the, the expression on his face, the tilt of the top, the kind of flabbiness of the body, the drunkenness, uh, just was totally different than any attempt that had ever been done uh, to to a, a statue of Bacchus. And as you notice, there's a, an appendage missing. <laughs> and we're not sure if that was a slip with a chisel, but that's highly doubtful. <laughs> or a, a vandal at the time. But judging from the condition that uh, Bacchus had in, we could probably speculate that it wasn't very spectacular right <laughs> under <laughs> this. This unfortunately doesn't show up well, but that's a little satire satyr in the back who's stealing uh, the grapes and hoping for a drop of wine that will spill out. Uh, there's a beautiful carving on his legs uh, that was done with a combination of chisel and drill. And nothing like that had been seen in artwork uh, or sculpture uh, before. Ted, is that from one piece of stone? One piece of stone, yeah. And another significant uh, deviation from the normal sculpting technique that Michelangelo used was that he carved all around the figure and worked on all sides at once where most of the uh, sculptures previously would work from one side and work their way around to the back. Most of the sculptures also that have been done before this were designed to be set up uh, against a wall or in a niche. But this one was designed to go into a garden, so it was totally finished all the way around. Unfortunately, Riario well, it was a bit 
The statue itself was a bit, one, whimsical, and two, it was really mocking uh, the cardinals and the lifestyle of some of the gentry in, uh, in Rome. So Riario didn't like it. <laughs> he said, I don't want to, uh, want to buy it after commissioning it. Uh, another friend of Michelangelo, who he developed uh, in Rome, a friend he developed in Rome, uh, was a merchant banker by the name of Jacopo uh, Galli. Galli bought this statue and uh, uh, then invited uh, Michelangelo to move into his house and do sculpting in his back garden and served basically for the next 20 years as his financial mentor, arranging and writing contracts uh, for him, loaning him money uh, when he needed money, and basically helping uh, him to get off the ground as an artist. This is something you find all through Michelangelo's life. He had this uncanny ability to find influential people, develop very close relationships with him, and gain their support. At the age of 23, in Rome, after he'd been there about a year and a half, and Bacchus was the main thing uh, that he had accomplished, he got a contract from the French Cardinal, Bier, uh, to carve a pieta for the French chapel in the Sistine, uh, in the, uh, in St. Petersburg. And, uh, Michelangelo uh, readily accepted the challenge uh, and came up with a design of Mary and Jesus, uh, full size, carved out of a single piece of marble. He spent uh, eight months in Carrera, which is about 240 miles outside of Rome, uh, looking for the ideal piece of marble. Uh, he knew it had to be completely white, have no veins, uh, no cracks, uh, and what he would do is have them cut a block, and he would set it up on the top of the mountain, mm -hmm. and be there at sunrise, and watch the sun shining through the stone. Also would pour, out, pour oil and water on top to get it just right, and as I said, it took eight months to get this piece of marble and get it back to Rome. His contract called for him to get the job done in one year and one day. The size is uh, five and a half feet, no, no, excuse me, six feet high, five and a half feet wide, and four feet deep. Mm -hmm. The subject of Pieta uh, really began to gain popularity in Germany about uh, 75 years before, in, in the late uh, uh, 1300, early 1400s, uh, as the churches in Germany were trying to find ways to impress uh, their congregation, who for the most part were illiterate, into the suffering and the sacrifice of Jesus and Mary. Uh, it was not a popular uh, subject in Italy at the time, or subject matter.